So if you're finding that in your recovery from dysautonomia, getting back to exercise, getting back to activity, getting rid of the brain fog is where you're at right now or the hardest part to get rid of, then I think this video will help. My name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. I'm at the Kaiser Clinic here in Chelsea, Michigan, and we specialize in helping people with neurological problems, find them and get better. So today we're gonna to talk about a quick exam that we looked at today where this person has been recovering from a post-viral dysautonomia and is actually doing way, way better but they reached out to us because they're still having a hard time with getting back to that full level of exercise, activity, exertion. And as you know, for someone that's used to that, not being able to exercise is really, really difficult. So being able to get that back is a huge part of the goals that we want to entertain. So I wanted to show you this though, because I think it's really helpful. Um, this is looking at an autonomic test battery, and it's a quick snapshot of a graph that we that we use very often here to be able to understand uh, the relationship of a tilt test, but also relative to a Valsalva maneuver, deep breathing test, the whole suite of autonomic activities that we're doing. But normally we're thinking about this in terms of right here, heart rate, and then sometimes blood pressure. A lot of times we see that even in a, in a supervised tilt test, heart rate really becomes the thing that people get fixated on, right? But if you look here, we start off at a baseline supine level of about 71 beats per minute, totally normal range. And then it climbs up a little bit. We get a delta, the highest delta is around 25 or 26 beats per minute. So that means the heart rate climbed up to 97, 96 beats per minute, okay? Which, by technical standards, doesn't really qualify as pathology. It doesn't really put you in a POTS category. Heart rate's not high enough to be put into an inappropriate sinus tachycardia. We don't have a drop in blood pressure. We go from 139 over 97 down to 133 over 108. We love seeing that diastolic number come up, which is brilliant because that way we know that those peripheral blood vessels are constricting the way they should to be able to maintain blood pressure throughout the body. So we like all those things. Now, I think this is where it becomes important to look at a little more depth. So if we slide over and we look at capnography, this is looking at what's called end tidal carbon dioxide levels. And end tidal means at the end of your breath, we're measuring that little snapshot of how much CO2 is in your lungs. And we use that as a proxy to approximate how much CO2 is in your bloodstream. Now, most people go like, well, I don't really care much about CO2. I'm really interested in oxygen levels because we know we need oxygen to survive. But CO2 is important when it comes to your brain because in the brain specifically, the blood vessels have two types of reflexes. Number one, they have a reflex that helps to control pressure, blood pressure in the brain. And number two, we measure the amount of vasoreactivity or we measure the CO2 as a way to understand metabolism in the brain. Metabolism is just a fancy word for work. So any part of the brain that is doing more work needs more fuel, needs more blood, needs more oxygen. So the way that our brain is able to detect those signals is to buy, is by screening or collecting the amount of CO2 in the blood vessel, signaling how dilated or constricted a blood vessel should be relative to that CO2 amount. That allows us when CO2 levels are high, we dilate, flush new blood in, when CO2 levels are low, we constrict the blood vessels and we shunt blood to other areas. So if we think about that, we want that CO2 number here to be between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. If you look down in this box here, we can see that even from a starting point, we're starting at about 30 millimeters of mercury and it's dropping. So that ETCO2 number is dropping as low as 28, 32, 31, 32, 29, 31, 32. So it stays relatively low throughout the tilt. And that's important because we can see the mean cerebral blood flow in this tilt is dropping. So we actually see hypoperfusion in this case where there's not as much blood going into the brain when they're standing up is when they're laying down. Obviously, if we're thinking about something like brain fog, we're thinking about something like exertion, we're gonna pair these two things together and we wanna make sure that they are able to have normal metabolic activity, normal vasoreactivity, and therefore normal blood flow to the brain. So in this case, this is one we're really excited for because we're gonna try to manipulate that CO2 level, see if we can, we can do the neural rehab and training in a way where we're not just focusing on heart rate, but we're actually gonna use these, the CO2 levels as our constraint to be able to determine how much work we can do 
before that hypoperfusion starts to kick in. So I'm really excited to get started with this case and I think it's gonna be very useful, but I think it's useful to share it because I think a lot of people are in this boat where we're actually seeing these metabolic changes and they're gonna cause that hypoperfusion to happen in the brain, but it's not, it's going undetected for a lot of people. So I hope that's helpful. If this is something that you're going through, give it a thought, give it a shot, see if um, there's a way that we can do some testing, get in front of this thing and figure out how to change it. So take that for what you will. I hope it helps a lot. Please send us a note, send us an email. We're happy to help however we can. Take care, talk soon.